Good morning and welcome to the Service with a Difference. It is the 27th of March 2022. It is the fourth Sunday of Lent and we are looking during this season of Lent at how our soul is, is like a greenhouse and we need to invite God to come in to help us clean the windows so that his light can come in and give heat and give light to to the soil and the plants that are in the greenhouse. We, we are asking God to help us um, mix the ground, restore the nutrients and just turn the soil so that the, the garden of our soul can grow into, into the garden of Eden in this greenhouse. And today we are looking at how um, even though God doesn't mess up our garden, it is God who comes into the greenhouse of our soul when we invite him in and, and he fixes, he helps us work the garden and he helps us make it the Garden of Eden. And so today we are reading from Psalm 32 and this and the psalmist speaks about how for him he found that when he repented of sin he, he just had the freedom to dwell in the presence of God. Before that he was guilty and couldn't come into God's presence because of his own guilt, not because of anything God has done, but in repenting of his sin he just found freedom um, to receive God's forgiveness and obviously that leads to us forgiving. And then we're going to be reading from Joshua chapter 5. We're going to read from verse 9 to verse 12, where Joshua, who has taken over from Moses, is about to lead the Israelites into the promised land. Um, they have just eaten from some of the produce of the land where they, they have settled so long. Um, and as they eat from the produce of the land, then the manna stops. And then we're going to be reading from 2 Corinthians. We're going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, from verse 16 to verse 21. It's that section where Paul is saying, if anybody is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And we can do this because Christ has done the work of reconciling us to God. And then we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 15. And in Luke 15, Jesus is being shouted at by the Pharisees um, because he is eating with sinners. And he tells them three parables, the parable of um, the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son, also known as the prodigal son. Um, and today's focus is on the parable of the prodigal son. And again, I'm going to ask that you put this on pause as you read through those readings. And as we read through them, we give God thanks for them. And we pray that he will bless them to us as we reflect on them in, in this moment. As I said earlier, Lent is that season in which we allow God to search our hearts. Um, bring his light in, shine it into all the dark corners, um, help us turn the soil, help us work the ground, um, help us add the right nutrients so that the gardens that are in the greenhouse of our soul can, can grow um, and become like the Garden of Eden. But when we invite God into our hearts, when we say, God, you know what, come and search me. We ask him to come and lead us. We ask him to come and guide us. You know, we, we ask him to come and be a part of our life, be that part of our life that is our passion and our drive and and our reason for living. It, it can be a very scary prospect for many of us. You know, it's tough enough to, to, to let a heart surgeon go to work um, on our body. How much harder is it? How much more challenging is it to, to let the great surgeon go to, go to work on those areas of our life that we are incredibly defensive about? As we read, from Joshua, we're reading the story of the Israelites who have been running around the desert for the 40 years. And they've been running around the desert for 40 years because they, you know, they're not obedient to God. They, they wanted to decide for themselves what was right, what was wrong. Um, they believed they knew better than God. God said, go. And they said, no, we're not ready to go. So God said, well, we're going to walk around until you, you trust me, until you believe you are ready to go. And now 40 years later, um, they realized that this whole time, they were the only ones who thought they were right, um, and that we call self-righteousness. And, and God has had to wait for these people, for the Israelites as a whole, to, to recognize their sin and to, and to realize that they didn't know better than God, um, that, that what God had said God would have come through with. Um, and so, so he's had to wait for them to recognize their sin, because it's only when we recognize our sin that we, rec we can repent of our sin. Um, and it's only when we repent of our sin that we're saying we want to try to do it differently. And so he, ha he has had to wait for them to, to recognize that they have been doing it their own way in opposition to God. Um, and as they repent of that, they are saying, God, let us help us to do it your way. God, help us to do it your way. 
And so God says, that's fine. And God makes peace with them. And God says, let's renew the covenant that we have between us. And God leads them into the promised land. Um, and I want to say the similarity in this in the parable that Jesus tells in Luke of the lost son or the prodigal son and, and the people of Israel is that both Israel and the son are wandering around in the wilderness because they both thought that they knew better than God. And God renews with both of them the covenant that he, he makes with them and they are blessed within that covenant. And we come to understand through these stories that that reconciliation is an ongoing event. It's not a once off thing, but it's an ongoing event. And so the covenant is restored and, and there is a celebration and there is a move from, from manna to unleavened bread. There is a move from manna to, to roasted grain. There is a move from survival to settled. Um, no longer do the Israelites believe they're an extension of the Egyptians, but they believe they are the people of God and they are settling in the land that God has promised to them. And so Jesus, as he, he tells this parable, he is telling that story of how we move away from God, um, recognize our need for God, return to God. God makes peace with us and God restores his covenant with us. And we are no longer just surviving as we are outside of God, but we are living within the glory and, and the presence of God. And so as he tells this parable, he is, he is telling it to a people of, of a different context to, to many of us. Um, Jesus is being questioned by the Pharisees because he is eating with sinners. And obviously in the story that Jesus tells, um, the Pharisees are represented by the older brother, those who are self-righteous, and the sinners are represented by the younger brother, those who are unrighteous. And so Jesus is being questioned by the Pharisees, and his response to them in, in this conversation is he tells them the story of the lost sheep, he tells them the story of the lost coin, he tells them the story of the lost son. And, and obviously in these stories, um, they are all kingdom of God stories, so they speak about the kingdom of God. And in all of these stories, these stories are not about the sheep, the story is not about the coin, the story is not about the son, the story is rather about the shepherd and about the, the lady who is searching for a coin. The story is about the father who is searching and waiting and longing and protecting his son. And so the story of the prodigal son itself specifically is a story of a father who is trying to reconcile everybody so that this family can survive. And, and it's a story of a father who is rejected by his children. The family has been split apart because the one son is asking for his inheritance. And when he asks for his inheritance, he is applying that to him. The father is already dead and, and the father foolishly gives in to, to the son. You know, it's kind of like giving a 20-year-old a Ferrari, um, telling him not to speed. Obviously, the son is going to go and waste whatever the father has given him. Um, and there may have been certain conditions for the son to have received the inheritance before the father died. Um, that, that would have been acceptable, but, but, but definitely not when that inheritance was going to be squandered. Um, and, and especially when that inheritance was going to be squandered amongst the Gentiles. Because at least if he squanders it amongst the Jews, come the Jubilee, there's a possibility that the father might get the land back, the family might get the land back. But when it goes to the Gentiles, then nothing is, is coming back to, to the family. It's, it's gone forever. And so the younger son has said to the father, to me, you're dead. And I want my portion of the inheritance. And it, it's not much better for the older son because he sees the father's foolishness in giving the younger son what he gives to him. And he, he does the same thing. To him, the father is also dead because he also receives his inheritance. He just does it silently. And so in this world that they are living in, um, anything that affects a family obviously affects the village because you can't separate a family from a village in subsistent villages. And so this family would have been shamed because the village would have been angry. And this village would have required the father to, to punish the son in order to maintain the social functioning that was considered right in, in Israel. And so in a society of honor and, and shame, for a wealthy family to be torn apart because of internal ructions, it would mean that that family was brought into disrepute. Um, and so they wouldn't be taken seriously in any of their dealings, in, in their business, in anything else. Um, and so they would lose their, their social standing. They would lose their political standing. They would even lose their, their economical standing because 
well, this is not the way things are, are done in Israel and you are acting outside of how we do business, of how we live our lives. And so if you're going to act outside of that, then we want no part of you. And so in this story, the father has lost faith and he will be shut out of village life. He will be shut out of village affairs. He will no longer have a voice at the gate of the village. And so in the story, we don't know when the younger son comes to his senses. We don't know if he is repentant or if he is just hungry um, because it just he says, I'm hungry. I would eat better if, as, as one of the laborers in my father's house. And so starving, he returns home. And what should have happened is for the father to save, save face, the father would, would have to beat his son when his son returns home. And then he would, would, would appease the villagers by offering them his son to beat as well. Um, but in this story, the father runs to the son and he hugs him and, and he kisses the son. Um, and so, again, the father is foolish, according to the standards of Israel at the time. The father is foolish, according to the standards of this world, because in, in this society, um, men of stature, old men of stature, don't run. They don't show their ankles because that means that they have no control over their emotions and over themselves because they shouldn't be running. Everybody should be coming to meet them. Um, and so an old man of stature in, in the society doesn't run to meet anyone except in an emergency. And, and it turns out that this is an, em an emergency because if the villagers got to the son first, they, they would have beaten him. And so with all of his effort, this father runs and he kisses and he embraces his son. And this is more of a sign of protection than it is of, of, of welcoming back because he, he embraces his son and he offers the villagers his back. He is saying, you can do nothing to my son. If you want to beat my son, you will have to beat my back. And so he offers them his back as he embraces his son as, as a sign of protection. And, and then he gives him a robe and he gives him a ring as a sign of authority because he's accepted him back as a son, not as a servant. And so the father doesn't disown the son. The father has never disowned the son, but he reconciles the son to himself and he reconciles him to himself without beating because God doesn't need to bully us as he reconciles us back to himself. And he, and, he, and he reconciles his son to himself at the expense of himself. Because in reconciling his son to himself in the way that he has, this father has once again brought shame on himself. After the father has done this, he, he reconciles the village to, to the family. And he does this by, by throwing a welcome party, by, by slaughtering the fattened calf. And they, they must have been content and accepted the father's offer because they came to the party. But then the older brother is unhappy. Um, he is supposed to welcome the guest. He is the one who is supposed to supervise the entertainment. But he, he even refuses to enter into the house in order to reconcile with his brother. And again, in the story, the father shames himself for the sake of the self-righteous brother because he begs the older son to enter into the house. He begs the older son to reconcile instead of ordering the son to, to come in and do what he has told him to do. And so this is the context behind the story that, that Jesus tells. And out of all the parables that Jesus tells, this one would, would most closely summarize the story of the purpose of Christ and why Christ came as man. Because let me tell you another story. There was this father, and, and we can call this father God, and this father had two children, and we can call those two children we, we and us. Now, one day, we came to God, and we asked God for our inheritance. You know, our father had given us everything we could ever need or want, but we asked for our inheritance so that we would have the freedom to choose our own way, um, so that we would have the freedom to choose between what is good and evil. And so we took our inheritance, and our inheritance is our life, the life that God had given to us. And we lived our life as if God were dead. And so our family has become fragmented, and, and, and it is so fragmented in many cases, we, we are not even able to acknowledge our brothers and our sisters, let alone talk to our brothers and our sisters. And so we gave that most precious of gifts away as if it were nothing, as if it cost nothing, as if, as if it held no, no value. We squandered that, which was the very purpose of creation for something as temporary as sin, just because we wanted to satisfy our, our sinful nature, 
our selfish nature, our rebellious nature. And so when we realize that a little bit of life with God was better than a whole lot of life without God, we returned to God only, only to find that God was not only waiting for us, but God had been running to greet us and he was running to greet us with a hug and a kiss. God had shamed himself on the cross because it was thought that the village and, and, and let's call the village death. It had, it had been thought that the village had the victory over the father's children. Um, and it was Christ's death that paid the price that was owed to the villagers. We, we didn't suffer at the hands of death because Christ, as, as the fattened calf, reconciled us to God. God, God ran to meet us. God, God embraced us and God offered the village his back so that the village couldn't beat us. Christ defeated death so that death could not defeat us. And the story continues, though, because we are also the older brother and we are not happy with the fact that we are accepted by God. We don't think that Christ's forgiveness is good enough for us or good enough for, for others. We, we can't accept that others can be forgiven by God. And we're not even sure that we can be forgiven by God. And so as Jesus tells this, this parable, it is a story about God trying to rescue the weak. It is a story about God trying to rescue the lost. It's a story of God trying to reconcile us with himself and with others. You know, we, we have brought shame on the family name. We have destroyed the garden of Eden that is in our souls. And it is God who makes right what he did not break. It is God who comes in and helps us rebuild this garden of Eden that, that is meant to be in, in our souls. This garden that we have long let be grown over by what we thought was good, but turned out to be evil. And so we find in the story how God wants to reconcile with the unrighteous as, as well as the self-righteous. And, and we know that it's often the unrighteous that are more likely to be reconciled. The younger brother is lost and, and he is found. But we don't know if the older brother is, is ever found. You know, it's harder to find God when we are busy standing in judgment of, of others. If you've, if you've ever heard a message somewhere um, and thought, wow, this really relates to this person or to that person, then in that moment you are being self-righteous. And if you have any doubts, just, just remember that you are also a new creation. And if Christ has been able to do a work in you, he is able to do a work in others. Um, if Christ is able to do a work in others, he is able to do a work in, in you. And so God has reconciled us to himself through Christ. And so it is through Christ that we are able to celebrate the beauty and the joy and the wonder that we, we find in, in the presence of God. But it is through Christ that God has helped us to reconcile with the rest of God's creation. And so it is, it is through Christ that we are able to share the beauty that comes out of this Garden of Eden that is in our soul with the rest of the world. We can share the beauty and the joy and the wonder of the presence of God with the world around us because that is what the world longs for that is what all of creation hungers and thirsts for shall we pray lord god we just we thank you that there are so many moments in which our need to survive our need to eat manna is replaced with moments of plenty where we even have an opportunity to provide for others and so lord god we ask that as we vacillate between the manna and the plenty as we vacillate between these two worlds because we so often believe that we know better than you. We, we ask, Lord God, that you would open our hearts to those moments where we do believe we know better than you so that in becoming aware of those moments, we, we would be able to learn to be obedient to your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to become aware of when we are being unrighteous. Help us to become aware of when we are being self-righteous so that we may have the grace to repent of our foolishness, so that we may have the grace to embrace your way of doing things, the way of love. Lord God, help us to be more like Jesus, who tells the story of your foolishness, who, who lives in the joy of your presence, than being like either of these brothers in the story. Even though we are both at times, Lord God, we ask that you just help us to be like Christ, who shares the story of your foolish love for us with the world. We pray this in your precious name. Amen.